So malaria is a big, big killer. And the point is that the neglected tropical diseases are not. They are horrible, horrible diseases. Uh, and probably the people who are heavily infected with them wish it did kill them, but it doesn't. And the other thing that puts these three on one side is they get a fantastic amount of money from uh, the Global Fund and from the American government in particular. The American government uh, has a fund uh, called the President's Malaria Initiative, which is funded with $15 billion over the next five years. And an equivalent amount of money, $50 billion, uh, is um, earmarked for HIV AIDS. So that's huge, huge money. In fact, with these neglected tropical diseases, we could, with $2 billion, we could eliminate them all, all over the world, in the next seven years. And I'll try and convince you of that as we go through. So they're the acute killers. But there's many <coughs> neglected tropical diseases. So anything that isn't malaria, TB, or HIV is known as uh, a neglected tropical disease. And for instance, the, the one schistosomiasis, which is the one obviously I'm very keen on, schistosomiasis control initiative. There are 10 times as many people with schistosomiasis in Africa as there are have HIV AIDS. So this is the, the World Health Organization's list. And uh, obviously, you know, we all want to go out for dinner tonight, so I can't talk about all of them. So I'm going to select the, the ones in red. Uh, there are seven of them, and they have one thing in common, and that is that we have drugs which will uh, have a, a, a real controlling effect on these diseases. They are safe, they are incredibly inexpensive, and they only have to be given once a year. And in fact, they can be given to whole populations because we never know who within that population is infected. And it's cheaper to treat everybody than it is to diagnose those people who are infected. So I'll just quickly run through them and, and, and talk about the various symptoms. The first one is onchocerciasis. The other thing about these diseases is that they all have names that um, only I can pronounce. Uh, and and if you, I'll test you over dinner if you can remember them and pronounce them. George Bush, who you all know and love, uh, George Bush uh, decided and was persuaded that he should, uh, he should give uh, money, some money, to neglected tropical diseases. And uh, eventually he agreed and Congress discussed it and they decided they would give $100 million. And uh, onchocerciasis uh, was, was one, of the, uh, one of the diseases. And uh, so he, he, was, he was given his brief and he got up and he said, ladies and gentlemen, we're, we're, going, we're going to give $100 million to a number of diseases. Uh, and the first one is on, on, so, uh, on, on um, anyway, it causes blindness. <laughs> and uh, basically he couldn't pronounce any of them. And that was with the names in front of him as well. So onchocerciasis is a worm. Um, which causes river blindness. And, and, and this picture, uh, 50 years ago, was incredibly common in West Africa. In fact, 50% uh, of all people who o over the age of 40 were blind. And that's only 50 years ago. Today, nobody is. And this picture, uh, there's a statue uh, in bronze outside the World Health Organization depicting a small child leading uh, a father or an uncle or a grandfather uh, who is totally blind. And there's an equivalent statue in the headquarters of the World Bank in Washington. So how and why do people get blind? Well, the worm is transmitted by a biting fly uh, called a black fly, which lives, believe it or not, in fast-flowing rivers. And uh, the, the adult worm is injected into the human body and obviously grows, <coughs> and it forms um, little knots in nodules. And the female worm lays, not eggs, but gives birth to live larvae. And these larvae, in order to continue their life cycle, have to get bitten uh, and taken up by a fly. So they circulate around the skin, and they cause the most unbelievable itching. 
But they also, these larvae, go across the retina. And of course, when they go across the retina, they cause people to go blind. We have a drug which, if given once a year, will sterilize the adult worms. So they don't give birth to any live larvae. So the itching stops within three days, and nobody goes blind. I'll talk about how we manage to deliver that in a little moment. The next one is, is schistosomiasis, which is also known as, as bilharzia. And there are uh, two forms of this disease. Uh, one causes the horrible consequences on the left, and the other causes blood in the urine on the right. And as I said, there are 10 times as many people infected with this as there are with HIV in sub-Saharan Africa. And the, uh, this is another of the parasites. They all have a life cycle. Uh, and so if any of you were infected with schistosomiasis, no, how, no matter how intimate you are with the person next to you, you cannot give them the disease. The adult worms live in, in, the, in the human body, and they lay eggs. Now these worms live in the blood, and they're a centimeter in length. And so, they're all laying eggs. In fact, every female lays, it's been estimated, lays about 300 eggs a day. And as you can see, uh, on the right-hand side, those eggs have a rather sharp spine. They've got to get out of the human body in either the bladder and the urine or the intestine and the feces. So how do they get from the blood vessels into, into the intestine or the bladder? And they do it by rotating through the capillary tubes, and they open uh, rather like a tin opener, they, they uh, rupture the tubes and, and they get into the bladder or the intestine. And of course, as they get in, they take blood with them. And that's why uh, the, um, the main symptom of this disease is blood in the urine and blood in the stool. Now, where there's no toilets, no hygiene, uh, people tend to go to the toilet uh, on the banks of canals or while swimming in the lakes. And uh, so the eggs reach fresh water. And if they do, the eggs hatch. <coughs> and the larva that hatches then infects a snail, an aquatic snail. After about a month, the larva that's invaded the snail has completely taken over the snail's body. There is fantastic asexual reproduction. And a new, uh, a new larva called a cercaria uh, emerges. Uh, not just one, of course, because uh, of the uh, asexual reproduction. And the snail will release a thousand of these cercari every day for the rest of its life. And each of these cercari is capable of penetrating unbroken skin of any adult or child who is in the water. So the, the potential for reproduction is massive. And I mean, it might be totally boring to you. I've been fascinated by it for 50 years. Uh, you know, how on earth does this life cycle develop? But it has. And uh, it developed really in, in the Nile Valley. And of course, uh, many decades ago, the Nile used to flood every year. And so all the snails would be washed through to the Mediterranean, where they would die because they're freshwater snails. And the life cycle had to start all over again. So the chances of people getting infected was, was pretty low, particularly seeing as the, the population of Egypt 100 years ago was only about 5 million. It's nearly 100 million today. And so more and more people are getting infected. So this is uh, the male and female worm and the picture of blood in the urine, uh, a picture I took in Niger. Uh, but the, the other, the other um, difficulty and uh, complication of schistosomiasis is that not all those worms get out of the, uh, not all the eggs get out of the human body. And if they don't, if they don't manage to break open a capillary tube, they get swept to the liver. And once they get to the liver, there's nowhere for them to go. So if you can imagine that maybe 50% of the eggs get out, uh, anyone with, uh, with, with 10 worms only, would, it would mean 1,500 eggs every day going to the liver and ending up there and causing a blockage. 
And these wells can live for 20 years. So 20 years after being infected, this is the sort of picture that you would see as the, uh, the poor individual's liver is completely blocked with these worms, uh, with these eggs, and uh, it leads to fibrosis. So just to compare the two, with HIV, there are something like 40 million people infected globally and 3 million deaths, although probably with antiretrovirals, not as many are dying now. But with schistosomiasis, there are 200 million people infected. 120 have uh, getting on for serious symptoms. But the number of people dying, we estimate, is about a quarter of a million or more. But schistosomiasis never gets on their death certificate, if there is such a thing as a death certificate. And in rural Africa, when people die, they tend to dig a hole and bury them because obviously there's no refrigeration and keeping bodies is not a good idea. There's very little post-mortem, and very few people who die of liver failure and uh, excessive bleeding, uh, very few people are linked to the fact that they've got schistosomiasis 20 years ago. We, we did have one little, uh, one little incident, and um, this is a, a newspaper that I'm sure you all read, The Daily Record, which is published in Scotland. And uh, when uh, Prince William was in, um, when he was in uh, St. Andrews, uh, he met this uh, other young lady, who you might have heard of, called Kate. And they went off to Uganda for a little bit of a holiday, and they went skinny dipping. And uh, the schistosomiasis worms managed to find him, and he got infected. So he was, uh, he was hit by this rare tropical disease, according to the daily record, because it's not really that rare. And the other thing about schistosomiasis is that um, quite recently the dangers of, uh, of, of having schisto to women has been highlighted. Because, uh, first of all, it causes anemia, not surprisingly, from what I've described. And anemia is a major cause of uh, poor birth outcomes. Um, the children that are born from anemic women uh, can be weak and underweight. And uh, you can have many more infant deaths and illness. And the other thing is that the, uh, the schistosome eggs that are laid uh, are, are, are all over the body. And in females, they do tend to uh, congregate in the cervix, where they cause lesions. And it's been shown that uh, females in Zimbabwe, Mozambique, and Malawi, in fact, who have female genital schistosomiasis, have much higher levels of HIV AIDS. And you can imagine that you know these lesions on the cervix open the door to HIV because uh, sadly there is still a situation where many of the uh, of the young girls in these countries uh, their first uh, first introduction to sex is with older men who may well be infected. Another disease, another neglected disease, which is uh, again very sad because it should it should never really occur, is trachoma. Uh, trachoma is called, caused by chlamydia, uh, and uh, the chlamydia uh, bacteria is carried by flies. And as you can see from this picture on the right, uh, I don't know about you, but I know that if I have one fly buzzing around me, it drives me crazy until I've either killed it or brushed it away. But, but these kids don't have uh, water to wash their faces. Their faces get sticky and uh, attractive to flies, and they actually get used, they get desensitized. And then the flies carry the chlamydia, which cause conjunctivitis. And then after a number of episodes of conjunctivitis, what happens is the eyelid gets scarred. And the eyelashes, instead of turning up, turn down. And these eyelashes scrape the cornea, which is a very painful thing to start with. But then once they've scraped the cornea, people go blind. It just is so unnecessary. We can, we, can take, uh, we can do surgery for advanced cases, and, and uh, eye, eye doctors, ophthalmologists can do it very easily. Uh, this picture I took in a clinic in Burundi, and uh, it, it was one of two eye clinics in the whole country, and every Friday morning, uh, the only eye surgeon in Burundi goes to this clinic, and people who, who need their surgery for, tr uh, for trachoma come uh, to be operated on. But as you could imagine, 
uh, the demand is far greater than <coughs> it's able to, uh, able to deal with. So the next one is lymphatic filariasis, and you'll probably notice that each one is more difficult to pronounce than the one before, and nastier. So lymphatic filariasis is uh, transmitted by uh, mosquitoes. It's another worm like, like onchocerciasis, but instead of forming nodules under the skin, this particular worm, unfortunately, chooses to uh, migrate to the, to the lymph glands. And it blocks the lymph glands, which means that the, the lymph, uh, which normally should drain and cleanse uh, the lower part of the body, uh, can no longer get out. And that leads to swellings, and it leads to secondary infections, uh, and it really is uh, a, a nasty disease. And the other thing about it, it's not just in Africa. There are a billion people who live in areas where they can get this uh, infection. And uh, we would, we, in order to control <coughs> it, it's a need to treat a billion people every year. What we have found, and amazingly, this has only been found in the last five years, is that in fact, this swelling, which was thought to be due to the worms, is actually due to secondary infections. Unfortunately, these people don't even have soap. But if we can uh, uh, get soap out to people who have these infections, and, and, and they put their, their legs up and wash them three times a day, within three months, the, uh, the swelling uh, is reduced by at least half. So there is some hope for, for case management. And then, uh, this is uh, unfortunately poor, uh, women don't suffer from this, as you might expect, um, but the, 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 the worms can actually block the draining of fluid, and so the fluid collects in the scrotum. And uh, this particular guy from Niger, uh, the swelling started six years ago, but of course, as you can imagine, people tend not to talk about it, and, and they wear the, the gel of ear, the, the sort of um, Arab uh, cloak. Um, and, and so people don't even know, uh, particularly in the early days, that, that these hydrocele's are occurring. What can you do about it? Well, what we can do about it is a very simple operation, which is to drain the fluid off and uh, get rid of the adult worms. And um, I gave a talk in a rotary club in America uh, a few years ago, and uh, at the end, showed this picture as one of the side effects. And, and the guy came up and he said, you know, I've seen this in Niger. I lived in Niger for a few years. And he said, um, I didn't realize there was an operation. And I said, yes, there is, and it costs $100. So he gave me a quarter million dollars. And he said, go and treat, go and do two and a half thousand operations. And so we, we, we put out a register in Niger, and we have 8,000 men queuing up. And we, uh, we, we brought in an expert from, from Senegal, and he trained 10 doctors in Niger. And these doctors uh, give a week of their time every year, and they, treat, uh, they, they, are, they do 600 to 700 operations. And, and it's incredibly effective. I mean, obviously, not within a day or two, uh, but within, uh, within a month, maybe two months of the operation, the, the guy's back to normal and uh, uh, puts a smile on his face. I, I could have brought his wife who has a smile on her face. <laughs> so then uh, I was talking to someone before we started about worms. Uh, there are three major uh, intestinal worms, Ascaris, Trichuris, and Hookworm. And the number of cases, as you can see, is immense. So basically, a third of the population of the world has one or other of these three worms. And this little girl is particularly bad because many people who have these worms, they, they only have a few worms and, and there's hardly any, uh, any symptoms really. Although, as you can imagine, if you've got a belly full of worms and you eat your breakfast, the worms tend to eat the breakfast before you benefit from it. So in poor countries, it can be very important. Top worm muscarous. And uh, it was only, oh, I went back 1970, it was found that the drug albendazole would uh, purge the body of these worms if they, if they were given. And we can buy 
our vendors are. I don't buy it anymore, but when I uh, first started SCI, we could buy a tablet of albendazole from uh, a generic company in, uh, in India for two cents or a penny. And uh, the result of that would be that this little girl would void uh, a belly full of worms. And there are almost a billion people who need treating. Um, as I'll show in a later slide, one of the problems is that the, um, the way that the worms get infected and, and people get infected with them is poor hygiene. And so where these people live in poor hygienic conditions and defecate uh, just in the open spaces, uh, the, the worms uh, reinfect very, very quickly. And the effect of these worms is quite devastating on young kids, uh, as you can imagine. And, and as I said, if, uh, if people have got a heavy dose of worms, then they're not they're, they're open to malnutrition. And uh, this is these these, um, these this graph shows somebody who is falling away because of his uh, uh, heavy worm load, is stunted, too tired to go to school. Uh, decreased school performance, but if we can get a tablet of albendazole to them every six months, within nine months they will rejoin the, uh, the normal growth curve, and that's for a penny per treatment. And treating school kids is easy. We just line them up, we train the teachers, and uh, instead of saying prayers at morning assembly, we give them, uh, give them a pill instead. And it only has to be done once or twice a year. There's another, another worm called guinea worm, which is, uh, I don't know, I guess, how many of you have heard of guinea worm? Not very many, one or two. It's, uh, it's an amazing worm, which uh, used to be very common in Africa. There's no animal reservoir. And the only way you can get infected is by going to a pond and drinking the water. Because as you drink the water in the pond, you tend to swallow the little water fleas and daphnia that are swimming around. And they are infected with the larval stage of a guinea worm. The guinea worm lives in the body for a year without anybody knowing anything about it. And in that period, it grows from a tiny worm the size of a pinhead to a meter in length. Uh, and obviously, if you're going to, uh, if it's going to continue its life cycle, it's somehow got to get its eggs into the water and infect these water fleas again. And so, what it does, the female worm, when she's grabbed, she forms a blister on the uh, on the on the leg or the ankle of uh, the individual who's infected, and this blister burns. And so, the natural reaction is to go and plunge your leg into cold water, when out come all the eggs. And the, the, the whole thing continues. And 30 years ago, uh, there were millions of people who were suffering from guinea worm, and it was a, such a debilitating uh, uh, parasite. But today, um, there, were only, there are only about a 1,000 cases in the whole world, and most of them are in southern Sudan. And this is because of water and sanitation, uh, people have been educated to filter any water before they drink. In fact, what uh, one company has produced is, is, is something called a life straw. And so people go around with a straw in their pocket, and there's carbon filter in the straw. And so they, if they have to drink pond water, they suck it up through the straw, and that stops them getting infected. The, the big push for guinea worm, the one person in the world who got really... Uh, excited about guinea worm when he visited Africa and decided to make it his life's work was President Carter, Jimmy Carter. And since he, uh, since he uh, ceased to be President of the United States, he has invested a lot of his fortune and collected a lot of money from everybody else as well to try and eliminate or eradicate guinea worm. And I think this year, in 2013, uh, there have been less than 500 cases in the whole world. So. As Jimmy Carter's 85 years old, it's a bit of a race against time to see who will be eliminated from the planet. But. <laughs> so this is, uh, this is the guinea worm. The, the only way that we had no drug to treat it, 
And so the only way that we can uh, um, alleviate the worm from people who are infected is to, when, when, it, when it comes out to lay its eggs, is to catch it. So you catch the end of the worm, and you pull it out, and you tie it around a matchstick. And then slowly but surely you, you pull it out to great hilarity for the people in the rest of the village. So this is a little boy and it's coming out of his scrotum. Of course you have to be very careful uh, that you don't snap the worm. Uh, so you mustn't do it too quickly because if you snap it, then the other end of the worm is still inside you and it would die and rot and, and, and cause awful uh, symptoms. So there's uh, most of that anyway. So I mentioned at the very beginning that all these diseases uh, can be treated by a single, uh, a single dose and that it's cheaper to treat everybody in an area uh, for the drugs. Uh, and there are a number of different organizations which uh, run these control programs. Last year, 700 million people were treated uh, in the world with one or other or more of, of, of the drugs. And the organizations that actually do the, uh, do the distribution uh, are uh, listed there. They're, they're all acronyms, and uh, I, won't, I won't bother going through them. But the big thing that's happened in the last five years is that all the drugs that we need are given to us free. Now, you all know that the pharmaceutical industry are thieving, horrific, cheating, lying, profit-making organizations. But fortunately, they give some of their profits to us. And without them, we couldn't do our job. But what is quite amazing to me is that they don't seem to, they don't seem to get any publicity for it, which I would have thought was one of the good reasons for doing it. <coughs> so against river blindness, the drug we use is mectizan. And as I told you, if mectizan is given once a year, the river blindness worm is sterilized. This was realized 25 years ago by the company Merck, which is based in America. And I think, rather like all of the uh, other pharmaceuticals did, they rubbed their hands together, thinking, wow, 100 million people in Africa are at risk of oxychiasis. We can sell this drug from now until doomsday, and we'll make a fortune. But the only problem was that everybody who's at risk of oxychiasis doesn't have any money. And so, I don't know how or why he thought of it, but the CEO of Merck announced, <coughs> okay, we'll give it free. And he committed the company to give away 100 million doses of mectizan and to stop this blindness. Mind you, they were selling mectizan for deworming racehorses and making a, a relatively large profit, but nevertheless, they didn't have to do what they did. And it was 15 years later that the next donation came. And uh, in a way, I feel a bit sorry for Merck because people working in GlaxoSmithKline found A, that albendazole would deworm people, and B, that the lymphatic filariasis worm, the one that caused elephantiasis and the large scrotum, would be sterilized, but not by albendazone alone. It needed mectizan with it. So GSK announced that they would donate all the albendazole that was needed for lymphatic filariasis. And Merck, well, they felt they had to increase their donation. So they now donate three times as much as they originally did. For the deworming, there's another drug called Mubendazole, and Johnson & Johnson uh, have for uh, several years donated 50 million tablets a year, but they've recently increased it. So they're donating 200 million deworming tablets. And GSK uh, have built a factory in South, Af South Africa uh, where their spare capacity is also being donated for deworming. So we actually have in our hands a 
and we've got to find a way to deliver it. But in our hands, we have 600 million doses of deworming pills uh, for use every year. The, for trachoma, the drug that we use there is zithromycin, and Pfizer uh, started in 1999, and they have uh, increased their donation as the, uh, as the work has gone on. And this year, uh, they've been, uh, as in two, 2011, and for the next three years, they're, they're delivering between 70 and 80 million tablets every year. Um, and by 2014, they're going to start decreasing because trachoma is being eliminated, and it's already being eliminated from a number of countries. I'm not going to talk much about leprosy today, but uh, just so that the company Novartis gets the credit that's due. Whenever anybody in the world is found uh, infected with leprosy, Novartis will give them a free course of treatment. Isai is a Japanese company, and they recently uh, agreed to donate DEC, uh, which is used in the Far East instead of Mectizan. And at the bottom here, Merck, uh, and this is a different Merck, uh, this Merck is, is in Germany, um, they uh, decided to join the bandwagon of uh, donating drugs. And in 2007, they agreed to donate praziquantel drugs for schistosomiasis. Uh, 20 million tablets a year, which sounds very generous, but it's only enough to treat 8 million kids and we got 200 million infected. So they've now agreed to increase their donation, and they're doing it step by step. And by 2016, they'll give us 250 million tablets a year. It's taken us 10 years to treat 100 million children. They're going to give me enough drug in 2016 to treat 100 million every year. So we're making progress. And all these, all these drug donations are uh, work centrally through the World Health Organization, and, and, and this chart just shows the countries have to ask for the drugs. They ask the World Health Organization, who place an order, and then the drug companies pay for the shipment to the country. But that's where we come in, because they don't know what to do with the drugs when they've got them. They don't have the funds to deliver the drugs on an annual basis throughout the countries. Uh, to the very rural areas where the people need to be treated. So the neglected tropical disease world has changed dramatically. We've got all these pharmaceutical donations which have increased substantially in the last few years. And in 2006, for the first time ever, a bilateral donor gave us money for uh, for, for the control of these diseases. First of all, it was USAID and George Bush and his mispronunciation. And he was followed by the British government and DFID, uh, who also uh, agreed to donate money for uh, the neglected tropical diseases. And then the World Bank came in, and uh, a foundation called SIF came in, supporting deworming in Kenya. And then uh, another organization called the N Fund uh, decided to set up um, collecting funding from high net worth individuals. And what they did particularly was, they were very clever, they went into the states where there are a large number of basketball players and uh, baseball players and uh, American football players who earn vast amounts of money. And mostly they're from Africa. And so they, uh, they go and uh, um, get them to donate money, which then goes back to Africa for treating the poor people. And of course, uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation uh, are very generous. They, uh, they supported me when I established SCI in 2002. Um, I had uh, just finished working in Egypt for about 14 years where we'd reduced schistosomiasis prevalence down from 60% to less than 5%. So we knew it could be done. So uh, I went over to the, uh, the Gates Foundation and uh, saw, actually it was Bill Gates' father I saw, and um, the CEO, and told them what a huge problem it was and how we had the, the drugs and everything. So they, uh, they said, well, how much would it cost? Well, I don't know really, and I don't really know that the countries will um, uh, will participate. 
So uh, they said to me, well, why don't you go around Africa and see how many countries are interested? Um, so I said, okay, I'll do that. So, um, and they said, no, we'll pay for it. So I wrote them a letter saying, I would like to travel around Africa and uh, find out how many countries would like to, um, uh, would like to control schistosomiasis, and then I'll put in a full proposal. And uh, by return of post, I got a letter with a check attached for seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars, which uh, in those days was, was huge. So off I went, and I went round Africa, I went knocking on people's doors. Uh, Minister of Health, can I do this? Can I do that? Are you interested in schistosomiasis? What schistosomiasis? Well, I have to tell you. And about halfway through my year, I was beginning to get a, a little, um, a little pile of uh, evidence together. And I got a phone call from the Gates, from the Gates Foundation. They said, Where, where's your proposal? So I said, well, you, you, you gave me a year. No, oh, we're only going to give you the money in a year, but we're having a budget meeting tomorrow, and we want to know how much money you want. So I said, $50 million, please. <laughs> so they said, OK. <laughs> and they. Uh, they had their budget meeting and they phoned me up two days later and they said, I'm afraid that we had our budget meeting and we can't give you $50 million. So I said, Can you manage with $34 million? So I said, I'll do my best. <laughs> the biggest grant I'd ever had in my life before was £50,000. <laughs> me $34 million. So that was the start and with that $34 million, we treated 40 million people. And we've set up, I mean, obviously there are a lot of incidental expenses, startup expenses, buying vehicles and hiring people and what have you. And um, I, I harassed it in Imperial College, who very kindly said that I could be ring-fenced. And uh, they have charitable status. So we are a charity, but we don't exist as a charity. Uh, we use Imperial College. I'm, uh, a, a bit of an opportunist, really. I don't have to have an HR director. I don't have to have a financial officer. I don't have to have uh, rent offices or anything like that. It's all provided by the college, which is why we are such a, a, a cost-effective uh, organization. So this chuckled along from 2002, but, um, and then in, um, in about, I think it was, when, when did Toby and Bill come, William come? <laughs> Four years ago, so I guess 2009, I guess email from Toby Ord and, and Will Crack saying, could they come and see me? And uh, so I said, yeah, sure. We can come see me. So they came, <clears throat> and they had found out about SCI. And we, 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 hadn't done any, uh, we hadn't had any thoughts about uh, raising money outside of what Bill Gates had given us. And uh, they invited me over to Oxford. So four years ago, I came over and uh, gave them a little, a little talk to to the uh, Giving What We Can group. And uh, I don't think it's a secret. Toby gave me a check for £10,000. I was absolutely bowled over. And uh, since then, uh, we've, we've been recommended as a cost-effective charity. And uh, I'll, I'll be hoping that by the end of the evening, if you're still awake, um, you will be convinced that we are still a cost-effective charity. Um, and, and, and that's that's just been a fantastic set of uh, support. And uh, what we've guaranteed to everybody, and I'm, we're, still able to, uh, we're still able to live up to that, is that any money that anybody donates to us, a small donor, uh, is used to uh, deliver the drugs. Because all my staff are paid for by, partly by the university, and partly by uh, DFID and partly by USAID. So the big donors pay for the overheads and the small donations we can use to uh, uh, pass the money out to other countries. So if you ever want to get a successful meeting, I mean, obviously, I'm incredibly successful. And when they announced I was going to speak, I'd have Bill Gates in the chair. Because this was a meeting in January the 30th, and I think it was held in some huge conference center. And uh, the number of people who applied for tickets, it was just unbelievable. It was absolutely packed out. 
and we invited uh, ministers from, from the government. So this guy was the Minister for Overseas Development at the time. This lady is the Director General of the World Health Organization. This guy is the CEO of uh, GlaxoSmithKline. This guy is the head of uh, USAID uh, in Washington. Uh, this guy is the uh, CEO of uh, Merck, who donate uh, Praziquantel. And there were <coughs> ministers of health from 15 or 20 developing countries, uh, including also some from, from Europe. And they signed, everybody who came, signed a London declaration calling for the elimination of neglected tropical diseases. And so the targets have changed. Because for the last 10 years, we've been thinking, well, let's, let's treat the most heavily infected people and let's, uh, let's reduce the burden of disease. But now, we're talking about elimination. And 2020 is the year that all the ministers of health have signed up to. Now, I mentioned the blindness. And these two slides, the map's a bit fuzzy, but this is the result of that Mectizan donation I mentioned. The onchocerciasis prevalence, these are countries in West Africa. Uh, the onchocerciasis prevalence in 1974 in all those villages that were examined was over 60%. Over 60% of the individuals living in those villages were infected with onchocerciasis, which meant that by the time they were 40 years old, they'd be blind. Each one of the individuals who lives in the whole of those countries, and there are 19 of them in all, has been given a tablet of, Albert, of Mectizan every year since 1974. And today, there is virtually none. It is truly one of the best ever uh, programs. And I don't think anyone's ever heard of it. It is truly amazing. And yet today, there is no blindness uh, uh, from, uh, from onchocerciasis. Unfortunately, the rest of the neglected tropical diseases we're still working on. But that is the example that shows it can be done. So for SCI in particular, over the last three years, we've had a spectacular rise too. We've had long-term support from Bill Gates. After the original 34 million, he's given us another 16 million. Uh, but after supporting the whole of my staff for uh, eight years, uh, he said in 2010, you're on your own. You've got to go out and find your own money. So we were very lucky. We, we, we got money from an organization called Legatum, and they came in, and uh, how am, I doing? am I boring wrong? I'm, I'm rambling on a bit. Is it okay? So uh, Legatum, is, there, there's two New Zealand brothers who, when Hong Kong announced that it was going to be given back to China, the property market went through the floor. So these two guys bought it all up. And 10 years later, they were multi, multi, multi millionaires. So they went to Brazil, whose economy was going through the floor. And they bought Brazil Telecom. And 10 years later, having bought it for six cents a share, they sold it for $60 a share. So they got so much money, they don't know what to do. So they, they read the Financial Times, where I had been interviewed. And I would said that I was very sorry. Bill Gates was withdrawing his support. Uh, we, we were very grateful for it. But uh, it's a pity that um, you know, in SCI is going to have to find money from somewhere else. So. They, these two guys came along to see me and they said, well, what do you want the money for? What do you do with it? So I explained what we're doing. And uh, they said, well, um, give us a proposal for a country. So I said, well, which country would you like? Because, you know, Nigeria would cost like $120 million and Burundi would cost $5 billion. So they said, well, give us, a, give us Burundi. So I wrote a proposal for Burundi and they said, no problem, we give you $5 million. So I said, well, I'm, I'm seeing the Minister of Health from Burundi next week, so I'll go and tell her. And said, okay. So I went out and I met the Minister of Health and, and she said, oh, that's wonderful. We, we haven't got a control program against any NTDs. So I said, well, for $5 million, I can do them all. So I went back and they phoned me up and I said, right, I've got all agreements. Um, 
would you like to give me your five million dollars? They said, yeah, we'll give you the five million, but actually we've decided we want to do Bur uh, Rwanda instead of Burundi. So I said, that's a bit embarrassing. <laughs> I've just told the Minister of Health in Burundi. So I said, why don't we do both? It's only 10 million. And so they gave us a check for 10 million. Um, <laughs> and we've been treating uh, all the neglected tropical diseases in, in Burundi and Rwanda for five years uh, until their support finished. And since then, uh, thanks to giving what we can, uh, I don't know whether you know this, but um, one individual, um, his, his sister lives in Oxford, and she told him, she said, you know, this giving what we can is fantastic. And uh, you've got a lot of money. Why don't you give some away? <laughs> so uh, he, um, at the time, we were raising money through Just Giving, which is, you know, a, a sort of charity giving site. And it, I remember it was, my, it was my birthday. We were out in the pub. I, I took all my staff out for a drink on my birthday. And whenever anybody donates in, on Just Giving, it pings on my, on my iPhone. Um, and at the time, we were getting maybe one or two donations every day, you know, 50 pound, 10 pound, sometimes 500 pound. So it pinged, and, and, and we were sitting there drinking, and I opened it up. 15,000 pounds. I couldn't believe it. So next day I set, I looked up, got his email, sent him an email and, and asked him if he would like to call me and he called me and I said, I said, that, that's a fantastic donation. Because in those early days it was <coughs> I said, you know, which country would you like would you like it to go to? And he said, No, I've never been to Africa. I, I, it's up to you. He says, But can I come and see you and learn a bit more about what you do? So he came in the next day. And I gave him this boring one-hour lecture and told him what we did and everything. And he said, oh, it's really good. So he said, if I gave you a bit more, what would you do with it? So I said, well, it's a standard formula. If you give me 10,000 pounds, we would treat a, a region somewhere where there are 25,000 people. I said, if you give me more, we'll just scale up. So he said, actually, I was thinking of giving you 400,000 pounds. <laughs> so I kept my face straight as if it happened every day of the week. <laughs> <laughs> ah, I said, well, we could do Burundi for 400,000 pounds, if you like, for a year. I said, then, what about next year? So he said, no, no, let's just do that. I said, and, and I'll see how it goes. So I said, okay. So I went home all excited. Best day of the life. I told my wife, I said, this gentleman's going to give me 400,000 pounds. She says, have you got it yet? Said, no. She said, well, I wouldn't get too excited. <laughs> <laughs> Women are more sensible. <laughs> so anyway, 10 o'clock at night, I get a text from him. I said, oh, I said, this is from this gentleman. She said, there you are, I told you. So he says, well, I went home, and I talked to my wife, and I told her about what we were, I was going to do. And she said, and what are you going to give him? And he said, 400,000 pounds. She said, don't be so mean, give him 500,000 pounds. <laughs> so he gave me 500,000 pounds, and since then he's doubled that amount. And we've been controlling uh, schistosomiasis, uh, onchocerciasis, and the worms in Burundi for the last three years with his money. So that's fantastic. And that's all because of giving what we can. He did say to me, he said, you know, what else could I do? And I said, well, have you got any friends? Um, <laughs> but he's a very shy gift, remember, he hasn't been. But he's, he's helped us uh, to, to and made introductions to other people. So then, sorry, I'm rounding up. Um, we get a bit of money from the World Bank, who support us in Yemen. <coughs> Sadly, we can't go to Yemen at the moment. Uh, but the Yemenis themselves run the program. We set it all up, and then, of course, they have this huge political uh, outburst. So then we used to have our, our meetings in Cairo, because uh, the Yemenis could fly to Cairo easily. But now we can't go to Cairo. So now we have our meetings in Geneva. Um, so I'm hoping Switzerland will stay, stay peaceful. Uh, in Zanzibar, we're trying to eliminate. And uh, DFID, three or four years ago, uh, I, I now ring fence uh, Cote d'Ivoire, Liberia, Malawi, Mozambique, Niger, Tanzania, Uganda, Zambia, and actually Zanzibar as well. So we've got enough money to treat all the people who need treating for the next five years uh, in, in those countries. Um, I'm 
just move on. So, <coughs> in 2002, when I established SCI, not a single person in Sub-Saharan Africa was being treated for shitless mice. The yellow countries, which weren't exactly third world countries, Brazil, Egypt, uh, China, and the Philippines had the programs for uh, against schistosomiasis. And these were the six countries that we started with um, in 2003. As you can see, uh, it sounds great. And we were targeting about 15 million people a year. But there's a hell of a lot of Africa that we weren't reaching at that time. Today, we are much closer to coverage. Uh, we have got a, a number of different sources of money. Um, the Gates Foundation still, uh, USAID, uh, Geneva Global, which is the one that resulted from those New Zealand guys, and from DFID, uh, the World Bank in Yemen, and then, uh, but what we use the giving what we can money for, uh, and we're also recommended by GiveWell in the States, uh, is for the smaller countries that are not covered by these big um, bilaterals. Uh, and strangely enough, two of the countries that have never received any money and any treatment are the DRC and Ethiopia. And we have used uh, more than half a million pound from uh, donations from uh, giving what we can and give well. And we, this, in the next month, we are mapping the whole of Ethiopia. There are 80 million people, and we're going uh, into all, I think there's 1,200 districts, uh, and taking five schools in each of the 1,200 districts, so that we know just how much prazoquantal we need to get from Merck uh, in order to treat. And DRC is a little bit further behind. We're having a stakeholder meeting in January, uh, as a result of which we will be, uh, we'll be mapping the whole of the DRC. Uh, if we can find anyone brave enough to go there. So, as you can see, that's a huge uh, expansion of our program uh, since, uh, since we started. And the plan is to reach national coverage in each of these countries uh, and uh, continue it through so that by 2020, there won't be anybody who suffers the serious consequences. So, what do we do? We do mapping first, and then baseline data collection, because it's very important that we go back to the donors and in our newsletters and actually prove that the drugs that we've given out have made a difference. So we measure the prevalence, number of people who are infected, the intensity of infection, because the more worms you've got, the more you're going to suffer. How much anemia <laughs> there is, the heights and weights of children that we're going to deworm so that we can show uh, that they get better. And we do ultrasound examinations of livers and bladders. These are the doses that we use. Now, this is the coverage. Uh, these figures, uh, I, I, in America last week, I, um, I, I've got the updated figures for 2012, but they're not actually much different. But the column is starting on the left. We estimate we need to treat 243 million people against schistosomiasis. In 2011, we treated 20 million, which is 10%. And so there's still a huge need uh, for the donations, despite the money that we're getting from different. With uh, deworming, there's about a billion people need treating, and we've been treating about a third of that number. As you can imagine, lymphatic filariasis and onchocerciasis, which programs have been going on much longer, are much, uh, much uh, further advanced. But overall, last year, seven, I think it's about 740 million people were treated with a free drug. And yet, as I say, nobody knows. I don't think anybody in this country, other than those lucky people who listen to me over and over again, actually know about it. It's amazing that they don't publicize it more. So, the World Health Organization and the Gates Foundation are encouraging us to go for elimination. So this is where we are now. Guinea worm's nearly there. Leprosy's nearly there. Sleeping sickness is nearly there. I haven't talked about that today, I know. Trachoma's halfway there. Lymphatic filariasis. 
River blindness is quite a long way away uh, down the line, but it's nowhere near eradication. We still have to treat everybody every year in the area. But look at poor old schistosomiasis and solar transmitted helminths. They're way, way down. And if, but if we can get these donated drugs out and into the communities, uh, that's not very clear, not very colored by, but we, we, we can be pretty close. But if we're going to reach the last <coughs> hurdle and we're going to cross the finishing line, we're going to need something extra. And I don't think it needs a brilliant mind to work out that what we need is improved water and improved sanitation. And so that's where we've really got to keep going. Now, for, for 10 years, my problem was the bottleneck was uh, praziquantel. There just wasn't enough available. We had to buy it before the Merck donation. But this is how it's going to go up. If it had given me enough money to buy 60 million tablets every year, the Americans are buying 90 million tablets a year, and the Merck donation is going to go up. Originally it was 20, this year it's 60, next year 90, up to 250. So by 2016, we will have 400 million tablets of Prisigrantol in our hands enough to treat 150 million every year. But we don't have the money to deliver it. And that's why we're still uh, walking around with our uh, hands out. We use a dose pole to weigh the children, and we do mapping. This is just a, an idea to give you just an idea of how extensive these diseases are. This is Tanzania, and every brown and red dot uh, the red dots are schools in, in which over 20% of the kids are infected with hookworm. And the brown dots were well, where over 50% of the kids were infected with hookworm. So what we're going to do is publicize this. And, and, and this is how we do it. We, we buy polo shirts and uh, distribute them. They're very cheap. And these kids are all given a polo shirt and a hat. Uh, as you can see, it's an SCI hat. And this was the Prime Minister of Tanzania and the Minister of Health. And if you can let, get them to come out, you get the television cameras, and you get good publicity so that everybody knows that the drugs are available. And the drugs work. Very quickly, just running through. These, this is the uh, schistosomiasis intensity in Uganda <coughs> after three rounds of treatment. This is hookworm after three rounds of treatment. This is anemia. It doesn't go plummeting down, <coughs> but slowly but surely the level of anemia goes down. And in Burkina Faso, the blood in the urine just disappears after a single round of treatment. So we've got all these drugs, we've got all these people delivering the drugs, and we've got masses and masses of benefits. Reduction of lymphatic paralysis, onchocerciasis, blindness, worming, hookworm, all the skin diseases, schistosomiasis, trachoma, Africa is going to be a healthy place to live in soon. It really is tremendous. And yet still, we've only got the two major donors. USAID, who despite giving $50 billion to malaria and HIV, think they've done really well by giving $450 million over the next five years for NTDs. And the British government, who as you know, have got so much money they don't know what to do with it. They're even going to build a railway. So <laughs> they have increased their donation to 200 million, which sounds an awful lot of money, but they're going to spend 50 billion on this <laughs> bloody railway, which incidentally goes under my house. <laughs> <laughs> not that that makes me at all prejudice. <laughs> So uh, we have these other donors, and uh, I must say that I'm very, very grateful to uh, the continued um, recommendation by giving what we can, and in fact, give well. Uh, and, and I think, apart from the one big donor, we, we, we virtually are bringing in about a, a, a million pound a year from each. And we use that to increase, as I say, the, uh, the, the Madagascar. Uh, we've never worked there before. Mauritania, Senegal, and of course our big push is in Ethiopia. And when we've done the mapping, uh, what we're hoping is that the British government will 
uh, increase their funding so that we can work in uh, Ethiopia and DRC because the small donations will, will never really be uh, enough. So there's no longer a big three, now with a big four, with HIV, malaria, TB, and neglected tropical diseases. The only problem is everybody says, but they're not neglected anymore. But we can't think of another name. Yeah. But to achieve elimination is a quantum leap. So we're just going to have to get better education, water and sanitation, which is going to need a lot of money, and reduction in poverty. So here's my message to you. It's simple. The pharmaceutical companies, beyond any ex expectation of donating the drugs, we only have to reach out to these kids and to the people once a year. And the results, as you've seen, are very spectacular. It's a best buy in public health. Are you convinced? Stopping is new people getting infected. 
So it's a completely uh, different concept. And with schistous mouses, again, we're killing the adult worm. Mm -hmm. So uh, with, um, um, in one of my other presentations, and I, I was just fiddling with them a little bit, and that didn't, figures didn't come up. In Burundi, we have now been treating for seven years, and there are just as many people who've got worms as when we started. But what they haven't got is as many worms as they used to have. And obviously, if they've only got a few worms, <coughs> it's not so important. So the reason you say you only need um, to give people a Benadryl once every six months is in order that the worms don't build up to a like, yeah. dangerous Yeah, level. so we, we let them get infected again, and then we treat them again. The other thing is our Benadryl, although it's a very good drug, it doesn't, doesn't really get rid of all the worms. Mm -hmm. um, so <coughs> yes, sir. Uh, early in your talk, you mentioned a figure of two billion to eradicate these diseases. Um, so, and in your last slide, you showed what current treatment could take us up to, and then what later treatments like uh, improving water sanitation. That two billion also well, comes. No, that doesn't mean that it's only for delivering the drugs. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but what I'm saying is that at, even at 50 pence per delivery, two billion, uh, two billion pounds would, would treat four, would deliver four billion treatments, and uh, we only need to deliver one billion every year. So that would be sort of four years. And in fact, the 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 50 pence is is a slight over over exaggeration because. Um, it, uh, when we get into the field, more often than not, we can do it cheaper. So for two billion pounds, over the next seven years, we'd be able to treat everybody who needed it. Um, and and, and that, that would be my first target. So by 2020, you wouldn't have anybody who has those horrible, uh, serious consequences. The water and sanitation, unfortunately, would cost a hundred times as much. Yes. Did the Gates Foundation say why they stopped funding you? Yeah, they said uh, if you, you've done a great job, we're very proud of you, but we aren't going to treat everybody in Africa forevermore. So we've proved we've given you enough money to treat enough people in enough countries to actually prove that it can be done, and now it's up to the World Bank, UNICEF. Um, and the major bilateral donors to chip in. And if you've done as good a job as we think you have, you should be able to raise that money. And fortunately we have. <laughs> yeah. And you know, they've, they've actually, the, the Gates Foundation has changed. Um, they've, they've changed their CEO. Bill Gates has re retired from Microsoft and he takes a much close of you. And, and they fund some really way out things. I mean, they've spent an absolute fortune trying to find a malaria vaccine. But one thing with the water and sanitation, they're, they're, they're investing. Now, I went to a lecture, actually, sorry, um, <laughs> by, by the lady, uh, a lady from the Gates Foundation, who spent an hour and a half. Um, they, do you know about the Grand Challenges? Have you heard of the Gates Grand Challenges? The Gates Foundation uh, puts uh, a large block of money. I think it's a hundred million, and they, they they issue a challenge, and anybody can come up with an idea, and if they like your idea, they'll give you a hundred thousand. So there's a thousand awards of a hundred thousand dollars each, and then if that's successful, you can apply for a big grant. And one of the the, the um, this time last year, their grand challenge was for uh, innovative toilets. And so this lady got up, <laughs> she, she drew pictures of all the different toilets that people had invented. So they, one person had come up with, um, with uh, a paint that you paint on the toilet, which is um, a, so, a sort of water repellent paint. So whenever anyone went to the loo, instead of sticking, it, it, it disappeared down a hole. And then another one, they, they had a flap that sort of shot back up again so that flies couldn't get out or 
snakes can come out of the pit. And there are all sorts of uh, amazing uh, new toilet uh, designs that they're now considering, and, and, and they're putting them out to uh, um, to companies to see if they'll manufacture them and try them in the field. So we put in a bit to get them from Burundi because we'd like to. Uh, I went to school in Burundi. And uh, they, the headmistress very proudly told me that uh, you know they'd got water and sanitation uh, in the school, and she took me along and they had two taps, uh, and then just further along they had this uh, they built eight uh, pit latrines. The only problem was with 2,400 kids in the school, and if you wanted to go to the loo, you know by midday you'd start queuing up at half past seven in the morning. So it, you know you, you've got to have the right toilets, you've got to have the right water supplies, and it's going to work. Yes, Michelle? Um, how do you choose which countries to go into aside from size? Um, it, there are a number of conditions. Uh, when we first started, we um, I, I visited them all, uh, and six more, but the money that the Gates Foundation gave me, I reckon, was enough to only do a really good job in six. And uh, first of all, it was uh, political will at the highest level. And the second one was that they had somebody. I mean, it's quite fascinating to go into any Ministry of Health in the remotest country. You can walk along the corridor, and there'll be someone with a notice on the door saying either neglected tropical diseases, more recently, or schistosomiasis control officer. And you go in, and he's got nothing. He's got a desk and a newspaper. And, you know, he's got no car, no drugs, no nothing. And that's where we've been able to make a difference, by uh, giving them the logistics to do the job. And so we needed to know there was a problem. We needed to know the political will was there to actually spend the money we would give them without say, diverting it somewhere else, that there was some expertise, uh, and that there was a willingness to provide office space uh, and uh, a willingness to contribute. Um, they didn't contribute very much, but they would give staff time. Um, they would give us an office space, and perhaps they would offer fuel for the vehicles or something like that. But, the ambition is to go to every country. Of course, we're having a bit of trouble finding people to go to northern Nigeria at the moment. A uh, bit of trouble finding anyone to go to the Yemen at the moment. Um, the Niger, we have to withdraw our people from Niger because of kidnappings. And, uh, but what we do is much more, and it's, ha it's, it's more uh, possible now than it was 12 years ago is to uh, employ local people, because there are people coming through from the local universities. I mean, Sudan, when I left Sudan uh, 25 years ago, there were two universities. There are now 34 universities. And it's the same in almost all of the countries. A number of the universities has just mushroomed. OK, shall we make this the last one? And then, because there's all that wine. Um, so you said the target for the eradication of control is 2020. I'm interested in whether you think that's likely or, or Oh, no, no, we, we'll never make it, but some, <laughs> some, some countries might, and other countries will jump on their coattails. So for instance, with lymphatic filariasis, one fact that I didn't mention was that the adult lymphatic filariasis world only lives for six years. So this annual breaking of transmission, in theory, if we can reach everybody for seven years, it will eliminate. And there are places where it has already been eliminated. It's been eliminated from Egypt, been eliminated from Zanzibar. Uh, but, you know, we're talking with a target of a billion people every year. So the actual drug uh, prediction is that it, it will plateau this year for the next three or four years but then it'll start to go down. But there will be, of course, some countries, DRC, Nigeria, uh, where there will be, uh, there'll be a reservoir of infection that we're going to have to keep Good. Well, so, thank you very much, Alan.
time speaking, and everybody feel free to grab some drinks.